Hi, today we are in Mount View in the NetBase office. Hi Michael, who are you and what do you do? Nice to meet you, Martin. So I'm Michael Osofsky and I'm the Chief Innovation Officer and co-founder here at NetBase. So I've been here since the beginning and um, have taken on this role of, of innovation, uh, really so that we could add executives to the team who had uh, you know, 20, 30 years of experience. And uh, I've focused on uh, bridging the customer and the technology, uh, inventing new products and that kind of thing. What did you do before NetBase and what made you come up with this business idea? So I was an MBA student at the MIT Sloan School of Management. I chose that because I really wanted to learn how to do innovation the right way. And there are a lot of uh, believe it or not, social scientists who have researched innovation and come up with some best practices for that. So while I was there, that's really when uh, the idea for NetBase came together. It originally started off as this idea I was going to create this enormous database of mm -hmm. the world's unmet needs mm -hmm. and the world's technologies. And we were going to randomly pair them up and uh, produce innovations. Uh, so it, it turned out uh, Another company was already doing that, Yet2.com, and uh, since then, the founder, Ben DuPont, has uh, become a, a friend. Mm -hmm. And so we actually had coffee the other day and talked about how uh, NetBase had to pivot, and we decided that instead of filling a database of needs and technologies and trying to produce innovation that way, we'd recognize that the database already existed. Mm -hmm. It was the web and social media. The word didn't even exist at the time. but. Uh, what we figured out we needed to do is uh, go out to the web and harvest the information that we'd need from marketers and R&D professionals, uh, extract it using a technology called natural language processing, and put it into a database, a searchable database to help people do marketing better, innovation better, R&D better. Cool. Michael, um, how long did it take for you to do the pivot? from the first idea, and then realizing actually another competitor is doing something similar, maybe I want to pivot. How, how many months did it take? So that was, I'd say, a fit before we officially founded the company. Uh, the company, I'd, I'd call our founding moment, really, when uh, we got our first customer mm -hmm. and uh, tested the idea out. So uh, several months before that, maybe six months before that, my co-founder and I were really incubating it as a um, a project in our respective MBA programs. And so we'd take different classes and we'd build out different aspects. So there was one class in particular uh, taught by Eric Von Hippel at MIT, and he had some um, research he was sharing around user innovation mm -hmm. and how users oftentimes are the ones who come up with innovations. And, but along the way, they leave this digital trail mark uh, leading to their pot of gold, what they've discovered. And that digital trail mark entails writing posts on forums and uh, maybe writing articles, mm -hmm. describing their unmet needs, describing the inventions that they've made along the way. So what I realized in a moment of uh, glory, really, it was this wonderful, wonderful moment just realizing this in, in one of his classes. It's like, wow, okay, that's what we're going to do. The, in, the database I needed was already there. Mm -hmm. It was all the internet. And it's this this digital uh, path mm -hmm. this, uh, that innovators have left, we could just snatch all that up and use, we had to have some kind of technology then to uh, extract it. And that ended up being a huge project mm -hmm. that we had to raise funding to get. Uh, but something I'm very proud of uh, about this company is that when we, at some point you have to set up your bank account, right? Mm -hmm. So the first deposit that went in wasn't uh, it wasn't you know venture capital chasing after you know the latest fad and it wasn't even like government grants because a lot of our competitors started that way uh, you know for some kind of pie in the sky research it was this middle road where we had found a customer who got value from our idea mm -hmm. we prototyped it for them we tried it out we delivered our results to them and they paid us Voluntarily, actually, we didn't even ask them. Well, yeah. So that first check that went into our bank deposit was for cold, hard cash that was earned by a customer, and that set the basis of one of our core values here at NetBase, mm -hmm. is that 
we deliver value uh, for customers and for our shareholders and our partners. Everybody's got to win uh, in order for you to have a healthy business. Cool. Michael, um, walk me through the prototyping that you did for this one client. So first, how did you find this customer? And second, um, this prototype, what type of data sources did you use and what type of value did you create for this customer? So it was a customer that um, they were an IP consulting firm and their job, they'd be hired by a large chemical company that might have invented something. In this case, it was these uniform microspheres, these tiny little spheres that you could encapsulate uh, drugs or other chemicals. And what was key, key about them is that when you ingest them, you could time release whatever mm -hmm. was inside. And so this invention uh, had been invented for one purpose, but the market for that invention was too small really to recope. So a common problem is uh, called intellectual capital management. You have to find alternate uses. And so that goes back to our database of market needs. Here was a technology, and we had to find other market needs. Other times, we'd have a, a, the, a, the opposite. We might have a specific market need, and we'd need to find technologies to solve that problem. Uh, the nexus of technologies and market needs, that's innovation. Mm -hmm. And so the innovation problem for this customer was that direction, uh, or sorry, that direction. Find a, have a technology, find a market need. So uh, typically, this would have been done with lots of manual research. Lots of just pouring over documents, maybe go do some focus groups. Uh, these projects can cost maybe $30,000 for an IP consulting mm. firm to do this kind of work. So our approach was to use publicly available data on the internet. Just suck it all in mm. and pull it down. So we didn't have the resources to pull it down. So what I had to do instead was this really uh, crazy hacking of Google, where we would just blast Google with all these queries. Mm -hmm. We'd be like, uh, we'd, we're trying to find unmet needs. So we'd figure out these certain phrases, like, uh, it's difficult to. Mm -hmm. um, um, the, I have a problem X. Mm -hmm. You know, all these different phrasings for words that we would find in problem statement. Mm -hmm. So we blast Google, blast Google, blast Google, pull all that data down, and that's all data that was market needs, and then we'd scrub it looking for needs that could be met by the benefits or the properties of this uniform microsphere. And so we found opportunities for, you know, different foods. I can't talk about it in too much detail, mm -hmm. but suffice it to say, what happened is we delivered the results, and uh, we had done it, this as a free project uh, because we had been introduced by the MIT Venture Mentoring mm -hmm. Service to this company. And um, they ended up paying for it because inevitably what happened or what probably happened was, you know, they went into the meeting with the client and facilitated a brainstorm. But whenever they got stuck, they probably had a crib sheet <laughs> under the table with all of our ideas, all of our unmet need markets that, that we had found for them. So they paid us a whopping $2,000. And we thought, wow, this is exciting. So that $2,000 then became the basis mm -hmm. of our pricing for our next customer. Mm -hmm. And so with our next customer, we got some introductions from um, uh, the authors of, of some great books in intellectual capital, capital management, uh, mm -hmm. um, Rembrandt's in the Attic, and, uh, and, and books like that. And so in our, in our second uh, pricing negotiation, you know, my co-founder, he, he did the business aspect of this, Jonathan Spear, he, uh, he thought he'd be brave and uh, he thought he'd ask for um, double that, right? And so our, our prospect kind of said, heard the price, you know, it's $4,000 and sat back I think my co-founder was pretty nervous at this point. <laughs> but it turns out the guy was so surprised because, because too what? Too low. It was way too low. <laughs> yeah. Typically, he said, well, I would have paid 20000 wow. for this. Let's, let's, let's settle on twelve. So uh, Jonathan brought home our first twelve k deal. 
uh, every deal after that was 15k so that became our standard price and that was in our that was in our forecasting models for the longest time mm -hmm. and uh, um, the other uh, thing that I was going to mention was is kind of how the prototyping works so I talked about how we harvested the data and we developed this kind of Google Blast mm -hmm. approach then we do a lot of manual scrubbing but then the output would be uh, we needed it to look like software because we wanted it to to be a software company. So <laughs> what we do is we would um, we would format a result set screen that looked like you just pressed the mm -hmm. the search button, but it was all hard coded results <laughs> that we had you know manually filtered data and you know carved out our own little uh, um, snippets mm -hmm. from the text. But to the end user, it looked like it was a result set. So this this is why we got a check, you know, for two thousand dollars because we weren't trying to build the perfect system right off the bat, um, and you know we weren't trying to develop. We weren't just trying to deliver a PowerPoint. We went middle road. We manually got the data. We massaged it. We made it look like software. And why this was so key is that because we had seen this can get this passes the wallet test. Mm -hmm. You know, will the customer open their wallet and take out money and give it to you? We knew that if we could give this result set and the way it looked to an R&D team, our own software developers, they'd have something to aim for, something specific and concrete. So that was sort of our first specification. Go make this more robust. Take out the, autom the, the manual stuff. And we even came up with a, kind of a mantra for the team. We said, well, it took us, I don't know, 40 hours to develop this result set. And we said, okay, guys, this is pain time. And all of you here, you're here as our, our Tylenol, our, our painkiller. Go reduce that time, make it smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And through the course of many, many iterations of, you know, of Scrum development, uh, we, we got that down to push button. Michael, if you look at NetBase today, how is it working? So what type of data sources are you using, uh, like Twitter, Facebook, Google, whatsoever? And how are you then analyzing the data? Is it only that you're using NLP or also like graph analysis or some other kind of analytics in order to get insights for matching this kind of technology with the needs? So the data is, like you said, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Uh, Tumblr is becoming a, mm -hmm. a popular channel. Uh, public areas of these sites, we don't get any private data. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll also get, you know, like the comments off of uh, e-commerce web, uh, websites and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So that's all of the data. And um, from there, yes, we apply natural language processing. Um, it's very deep. So you know, for example, uh, this this can of Coke that you have here. What do you what do you like about uh, What do you like about Coke? Hmm. Actually, good question. Maybe just the taste. You like the taste. Martin, believe it or not, some people like the fact that Coca-Cola is harsh. Harsh? Okay. Yeah. It burns their throat. And they love it. Okay. So if somebody says that, we're able to figure out that they've said something positive, despite the fact that it has a bunch of negative words in it. Mm -hmm. So we don't treat that tweet like a bag of words, mm -hmm. we look at the combination of the words, we parse it, and we figure out, okay, this is a positive, and what's positive is that it's harsh, or that it burns their throat, mm -hmm. and that's considered something positive. The competitors that we have in the market, they'll most likely label that as a negative, mm -hmm. uh, just because of its prevalence of, of negative words. But natural language processing gets at the core. So we go very, very, very deep. But we're also, what's special about our technology is that it's very fast. Mm -hmm. Within 11 seconds of somebody tweeting how they love the co co burns their throat, we've, we've not only obtained it from Twitter, mm -hmm. but we've pushed it through our natural language processing, mm -hmm. and we've surfaced it on the user interface. Somebody might have a live dashboard or a live pulse running mm -hmm. about Coke, and it'll show up labeled appropriately, put in the right you know, analysis and all that stuff. So mostly it's natural language processing, We're also beginning to do some image analysis. 
Uh, we do some statistical analysis too, uh, words and phrases that are important. But you know where where we're a little different from our competitors is that if uh, you know somebody's talking about Taco Bell, you're not going to see taco up here and bell down here in the word cloud or something. It's Taco Bell. We know that that's a, a, a phrase, so we're pretty good at that that sort of thing. So those are some of the analysis. Cool, Michael. What type of products or really kind of use cases are you delivering to what type of customer segments? So a lot of our customers are consumer insight groups. Uh, they traditionally go to um, agencies for focus groups and surveys and that kind of thing. And we're faster, better, and uh, a lot less expensive. Uh, to do that because um, you know a focus group can only you can only look at a handful of people mm -hmm. so very small sample size plus you have like group think and the different kinds of biases that come into the research now every technique of understanding consumers has its own biases some people put these you know biometric sensors on your head and then make you shop around the store well you can get a positive or negative read on that maybe with some degree of accuracy but you don't maybe really know what's going on for them. What are they thinking? What are their thoughts? We get at that. At any rate, if I can't convince our customer that we're better because of these, these benefits, we always have the fallback of this is a heck of a lot faster. To set up a focus group or survey, it's going to take you months. And you can only afford to do it once, a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Within 11 seconds of you tweeting about that Coke, we've got that insight produced and so it's very fast mm -hmm. and very very inexpensive and that inexpensive means that you can get insights about a lot of other things so if you're coca-cola you don't have to just look at what people think about your brand you could also look at your competition how many competitors do you have there are so many soft drinks out there and then you can think about things like the ingredients uh, what do people think of high fructose corn syrup or what do they think of sodas in general uh, or what do they think about the Olympics? That gets into another use case, is uh, helping you understand consumers so that you can generate better creative and better targeting. Uh, another use case is audience marketing, where maybe I'm, maybe I'm uh, Walmart and I've got you know, millions of people talking about me. Well, maybe they've mentioned Walmart once in the year, but what else are they talking about? Mm -hmm. What else, where else are they shopping? What else are they, you know, what are they talking about eating and drinking? What do they drive? What do they watch? If we know that, that's going to tell us where should we be advertising, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So audience marketing is another use case. There's a bunch of use cases. Uh, there's so many applications for this data. And um, that's just scratching the surface. Great. Michael, imagine I'm a, I'm a customer of yours. And I've got a research question. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, what are people thinking about my brand? Is it then that I just can plug in into your platform and write a query in, in human language speaking and your machine will automatically filter out what it means and then look for patterns and give me the result back? Or is it more that you have some kind of predefined analytical solutions which I then can tap into? It's a combination of both. So it's very easy to use. Uh, what you do, let's say your brand, let me, let me give you an interesting one. Let's say you work for Dove. Mm -hmm. Is that a bird? Is yes. that a chocolate? <laughs> so w we might have both of those as customers. Mm -hmm. So we've got to help our system understand which of those Doves you mean. Mm -hmm. And so that's a process called uh, brand disambiguation. And we provide you a wizard mm -hmm. that helps step you through where we're going to show you here, here's your brand Dove. You just type in Dove and we show you, okay, here's words and phrases, hashtags, people, domains that are commonly uh, mentioning your brand Dove. And so you would, let's say you're the, the chocolate, you would quickly see people talking about shampoo. Mm -hmm. So you'd select shampoo as an exclude. Yeah. And then it updates and now it's a little bit cleaner and maybe so some brands, uh, one of the trickiest brands we've ever had to deal with was, was All. Another tricky one is Uber, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, Uber uh, is, you know, everybody's always throwing up their arms, it's Uber delicious, whatever. So um, some of these brands can be really tricky. 
Now, if you have a really tricky brand, as a service, NetBase can clean it up for you, can disambiguate it for you, and then you can focus on the analysis. So the analysis is fairly predefined, but you can take it in any direction you want. Uh, what we'll normally give you is, we'll tell you uh, the sentiment about your brand, and so that's a score we report called net sentiment that ranges from negative 100 to positive 100. It's, a, it's an actual um, ratio. Mm -hmm. And we're able to compute this ratio because the accuracy of the underlying analysis is so good. Mm -hmm. We can even trend it for you. So we can give you very up-to-date information on the net sentiment. So you don't have to go do that customer satisfaction survey or this can help complement mm -hmm. that. So we're also computing things like passion. So there is a big difference between somebody who just uh, likes Coke and somebody who really loves it, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of passion. So we'll compute the, the ratio of the strong emotion, whether it's positive or negative, to the weak, to the weak, and that's another uh, metric. Then we're, we're also different from our competition in, in addition to being very accurate on those analytics. We'll, we'll take you deeper. So there's three, three things that we're going to tell you. First, we're going to tell you what, um, what opinions do people have? What specifically do they like or dislike mm -hmm. about Coca-Cola? Maybe they like the taste, and maybe they hate that it's harsh. Uh, how does it make them feel? So we do this emotion analysis. Mm -hmm. and, and it was really Coke that drove us in that direction because Coke, their marketing budget is all about make this product, make people happy, mm -hmm. make them love it. So uh, emotional analysis and then uh, behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. So somebody might be switching phone carriers, that's a behavior. Or somebody might recommend this particular movie, that's a behavior. Mm -hmm. Or they intend to buy, or they intend to shop. And so that's a, that's a whole metric that we can compute. Mm -hmm. Net intent to shop, a score from negative 100 to positive 100, whether or not people are saying that they're going to shop at the store. So those are the three uh, types of sentiment insights, and then we'll do hashtag analysis, popular posts, popular authors, cloud score, pop, just all kinds of different things that we can give you about it. Cool. Michael, how do you nowadays acquire customers? So like something like the direct uh, sales force, or have you a partnership network? Both. We have uh, sales through direct, and then we have uh, partnerships, particularly for international. It's a great point of leverage. So we support over 40 different languages, um, but uh, most of the you know, US sales presence itself is in the United States and in Europe. So to cover uh, Brazil and Japan and you know, places like China, uh, we've got a very, very good Chinese parser because Dr. Wei Li, our principal scientist, um, he's a Chinese national. And uh, this is, this, it, NetBase is his third incarnation of a Chinese natural language parser, parser. So we're very strong in that technology as well. And so we cover these other geographies through partnerships. And those are mainly consultants or just sales organizations? So they would be maybe like agencies mm -hmm. or um, third party software vendors where they'll provide you know additional support on top of what we offer because they speak the native language and that kind of thing. What has been the m most innovative, let's say, uh, usage of your platform that you can think of? Hmm. Well, I think probably the most interesting thing that we've developed in the last few years uh, in response to customers is this audience marketing idea. So I have maybe a million followers. I've, I've got a big brand. Mm -hmm. And I want to know, well, maybe they mention me once a couple of times a year, but what else are they talking about? This is an opportunity to get a focus group of a million people, you know, and find out right now the types of things that I want to know, like uh, what do they say they eat or drink or drive or watch or recommend. Uh, all sorts of questions that I would normally have to answer through a focus group that I can only afford to do once a year, maybe once every two years, and it's got a very small sample. We're talking millions of people, very, very nice big sample that you can then take and uh, do things like figure out, well, where should I be advertising? Um, and uh, what new products should I be developing? So insights about new, new product development and innovation. 
But with audience 3D, audience marketing, once you have those insights, you can then turn around and target people. So let's say that we have a customer that is a um, fast food restaurant and they're putting a new menu on their item, sushi, let's say. So now you want to drive people who love sushi or who eat sushi in the door. Mm -hmm. So with NetBase, you can, you can, you can um, harvest an audience of people who love sushi, mm -hmm. eat sushi, um, you know, all kinds of things that they do with sushi. But because of our rich behavior and emotional analysis, we can find those people. And then through um, advertising of, uh, it's called tailored audiences or uh, custom audiences on Facebook and, and uh, so on Twitter and Facebook respectively, you can p target them with specific messages. Messages that where you've come up with creative ideas for how to resonate with them based on the audience marketing. And then of course measurement. So this solution, which um, really customers push us in this direction, but it turned out that our technology was a great fit. It allows them to discover new audiences and opportunities, target audiences with key messages that will resonate, and then measure the effectiveness of those campaigns. Michael, when I look at the data that you are getting from, you said before it's basically public data, so yeah. actually everybody could have access to the same data. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, what makes you n unique? Is it A, the, the technology in terms of the NLP, NLP analysis or that you are really giving near-time analytics? Or is it that you have found a cool way or efficient way to reach and acquire customers? What makes you unique and why is it so hard for other uh, competitors to copy this? Well, let's first understand what we're doing. So the, for the layman, what NetBase does for you is we read, mm -hmm. okay? So again, referring back to a brand like Coca-Cola, they might have thousands of posts per day. Mm -hmm. All right, maybe they can hire some people to read that, but can uh, they read the thousands of posts about their seven to 10 competitors? And this is every day. Then on top of that, you've got all of the people who are talking about these brands, plus the category itself, soda. Mm -hmm. you're, now you're talking millions of posts a day. And on top of that, all of those people, that's the audience that you want to target to get them to consume your beverage. You need to really enrich your understanding of who that audience is, right? Mm -hmm. And to do that, you need to be able to track those million people. What are they talking about? every single day. Mm -hmm. Millions of people. So now you're talking about billions mm -hmm. of conversations. It's impossible to stay on top of that. So in order to solve this problem, NetBase has developed very accurate analytics that reads for you at a very, very fast pace. And we have, um, we have a whole bunch of patents pending. We have some patents yeah. that have been issued on how to do this at scale mm -hmm. and very, very quickly and uh, none of our competitors have been able to replicate it, and that goes back to our founding moment. We delivered for a customer value that we confirmed this is what you want, this is what the customers want, and then that became the basis for our product development, not only for our user interfaces, but for our analytics as well. We hired Dr. Wei Li and his team of natural language processing experts, computational linguists, who have been taking the results that you know, we analyze for customers manually, and they've been uh, slowly whittling away at the amount of time that it takes to go through results, just automating more and more and more of it. That's what we've been doing for 11 years, and we can do it now across 40 languages, mm -hmm. all this kind of analytics. Uh, nobody, none of our competition made that investment early enough, so it's too hard for them to catch up. Great. Michael, uh, this is your fir first company, but you have been in the business for like 11 years. What have been the major learnings that you can share with other people interested in entrepreneurship? Major learnings for entrepreneurship. I'd say uh, one learning that we, that, we, that we had was you sometimes need to rethink uh, who you're targeting. 
because originally we were an innovation business. We were called uh, Accelevation. We were accelerating innovation, right? So we took our product out to the market and we tried to find people who were innovating. Now, all companies will tell you, oh, we innovate, we innovate. But when you ask them who is innovating in your company, because you, you need to cold call and mm-hmm. find out, very few companies had an innovation person. Now there are a few that have a chief innovation officer, but typically that person is kind of running brainstorming competitions and that kind of thing. But who's actually going, you know, talking to customers, understanding technology landscapes, bridging them together, prototyping, developing new products, sizing markets, championing these ideas, that is often a very diffused process. So what we had to realize is that too few companies had an innovation function. What we had to do is recognize how companies actually innovate is they have a marketing department and they have an R&D department and there's lots of rifts between them and there's lots of changeover, but these are two different departments and we have to have a product for marketers and we have to have a product for R&D people. So we dropped the name Accelevation, we came up with the name NetBase that would appeal to either one and then we split our product into two. Mm -hmm. We ended up uh, spinning out this one to Elsevier and then we focus our own brand just on the marketer. So that's one of the takeaways is that sometimes you have to recognize that you may have built this um, elegant, beautiful uh, system, but it may assume that it's going to be used in a certain way that's not realistic. So you've got to adapt and re brand potentially uh, resize your market and and we were fortunate we didn't have to go like oh markets this is smaller we went the opposite way we said oh the market is too too small we're gonna broaden it mm-hmm. so you might have to resize your market and you might have to repackage your product what other type of advice can you give to first-time entrepreneurs so other advice I'd say uh, try to bootstrap your business as much as you can and bootstrap doesn't mean reach into your back pocket and hose dollars into your company. What that means is go see how can you deliver value to your customer right now? You know, before you have any kind of product, is there some kind of service that you can offer that's going to get money in the door, help give you validation so that you can bring on investors at a better valuation for yourself and give you the learnings so that you can Uh, drive your product development process. So as much as possible, try to be getting cash in the door uh, from the very first day. Great. Michael, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thank you, Martin. Great. So if you are starting a company and you are developing an awesome product and nobody wants to buy your product, maybe you need to redefine your target audience or maybe even your branding like NetPaste did. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Michael.